On May 12, 2014, I had a cardiac arrest. Rosie has a, a weakened heart muscle and has been treated with medications for this for years and presented to the hospital in May after having a cardiac arrest. She was in the minority of, of patients that managed to survive to make it to the hospital. You know, when I first got to the hospital, my husband said they were waiting for me. So they knew I was coming, and he said that they just snapped right into action. They got me stable and took me to ICU. We knew that she was going to need some protection going forward because of what had happened. SICD, or a subcutaneous implantable cardioverter defibrillator, is an electronic device that's placed underneath the skin. And the job of this device is almost purely to watch for very, very fast, life-threatening heart rhythms. It's right here, and you can't see it with my clothes on, but you know, when you take them off, you see a little budge, but it's not that bad. She did have a shock from the device, and in fact, she had a very, very fast heart rhythm. It's about 200 beats a minute. If it weren't for the device, it would be um, surprising for her to have beat those odds twice. I would like to see the people that helped me that I don't remember, so I can tell them thank you in person. Because you know, you can say thank you all you want on this camera, but I want to touch them and hug them and say thank you. Pete Smith, Pete, thank you for saving my wife's life. All the first responders here, I really appreciate you. The medical staff here at Memorial Hospital, the care that you provided for my wife was outstanding. I knew she was in good hands. And uh, man, you guys did a wonderful job. And uh, we want to say thank you. I don't remember you guys, but thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. You guys got there quick, so I'm told. So, but. And if it wasn't for you guys, I probably wouldn't be here right now. And I want to thank you guys. When I say I have a new lease on life, it's like I don't let little things bother me anymore. I don't stress out like I used to. You never know when your time's going to come. And my time almost came. This is my life now. I'm fine. To me, being blind is probably one of the worst disabilities you can have because I can't see what's out there. I can't see who comes knocking at the door. So you have to have a lot of trust. I don't know if I can describe it to you. I really don't. I assume that you see everything very vividly. I don't. I feel it. I hear it. But I'm not seeing anything. It's just dark. Jamie suffers from retinitis pigmentosa, which has left her with no vision. The ability to ambulate in her home, to prepare a meal, to see her son, these are the things that would change her life. I have a 29-year-old son. I just remember little glimpses as he's growing up. And I don't even know if those glimpses are what I really really saw or just imagined. There's never been any treatment that ever improved the vision for patients with retinitis pigmentosa. The Argus II retina implant is the first chance that we've had to restore some vision for our patients who've lost all of their vision. The camera on these glasses will communicate with the implant on Jamie's eye to allow Jamie to have visual perception. I don't have any expectations. Anything that I get is a gift, you know, is going to be better than what I have now, because what I have now is nothing. After five hours of surgery, we are very pleased that the UC Health Eye Center is one of the first sites in the western United States to implant the Argus II retinal implant. I'm nervous, but it's going to open a new chapter and, and I'm going to have to adapt to things differently again, but, you know, that's what it's about. Okay. The first thing that I want to lay my eyes on when they turn the device on is, is my son, definitely. He is just my best friend as well as my son, and he is definitely going to be there and a, and a part of this. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Being able to see the shadows, see doorways and window frames, and walk down the street and see somebody coming towards you is a blessing. I take life a day at a time and hope for the stars. <laughs>
On March 28, 2014, I was in a severe car accident that left me with no feeling or movement in my right leg. We just hit black ice and the car went rolling. I was ejected 20 or more feet from my car before it rolled, so I'm lucky that the car didn't roll on me. At the scene of the accident, I actually tried to get up and walk, and they had to hold me down and make sure I wouldn't move. I was first admitted to the hospital in Gillette, Wyoming for my initial surgeries. It was extreme. She had lots of... Uh, damage. Damage. She was broken. One of the doctors showed me her x-ray on, on the computer. She looked like puzzle pieces laying on a table that needed to put back together. The severity of my trauma at our hospital wasn't sure if they'd be able to handle me. They were just looking for the right place um, and the place that would accept her and thankfully it was here. They said, you're going the best place you could go. This is where you need to be. I actually got a notification that we were getting a, a trauma transfer from a rural Wyoming hospital and that they were coming by air. I looked at the list of injuries and thought, wow. When she arrived here, she had severe injuries and required a, a very aggressive stabilization and was going to need more surgery here. She had a small bleed within her brain. She had mechanical ventilation supporting you know, her breathing for her. She had multiple rib fractures. She had a collapsed lung. Her liver had a laceration. Both kidneys were injured. Her spleen was injured. Her pelvis was, as a bony structure, was completely unstable. When her pelvis broke, this entire uh, half of her pelvis, including this is her hip socket where her thigh bone would have been, separated out an inch to an inch and a half away from her spine. Uh, in the accident. And this is one of the worst pelvis fractures that I have ever seen. You know, this is an injury pattern that has a high, high risk of death. The first few hours are, they were incredibly critical and it required a breadth of disciplines and support staff to get her where she needed to be. I don't remember really much of waking up, I just remember all of a sudden just seeing tubes and the TV and just my mom and the hospital bed and nurses. You know, I was scared. And so her mom and I are both at bedside and we're talking to her, you know, and said you were in a bad accident. You're in Denver now, but your family's here. My one leg didn't move, my right leg, so that was pretty scary to me. I get sad about my leg not waking up. That's, that's the hardest thing for me. It hasn't woken up yet. They think it will, at least to my knee. Anything beyond that will be a bonus, so. As she went through multiple operations every couple days, she got to the point where we were actually able to remove the breathing tube, and when she was able to talk, you know, a lot of her discussion was, well, how do I get to the next point? You know, what's the next step? How, when am I gonna start walking? And what can I do to help you get to where I can move? And so the entire course, you know, she was like that. Devin, from the moment she sort of woke up from her sedation and things like that, was determined to do well. She understood that it was a bad injury. She knew she couldn't move her leg, but I don't think I ever went in her room where she didn't have a smile on her face, whether she was hurting, whether she was working hard with physical therapy. Um, I think that the, the first thing I think of when I, when I hear Devin's name is her smile. Um, and I think she's gonna do well because of that. When I think of a Devin, I have to, the thing that comes to my mind first was when I saw her in clinic in follow-up and her mother had her phone. And she showed me a video on her phone of when Devin took her first steps in the rehab unit back home. And it brings to mind that I think Devin is one of the bravest, most courageous people I've ever met. When um, Dev took her first steps with her brace, it was surreal. Just like when she was a baby and she took her first steps. That's almost the same experience again. <laughs> She's a courageous young lady. She is, wow. <laughs> to get through what she's gone through and come out positive, amazing. It's a pretty inspiring story. You know, you always know you love your children and your family and you, you know it. 
Um, but when you're tested like that, oh man, you don't realize how much you appreciate the fact that you have them here to love. So. They fought for her and they, they worked hard to keep her here. Words truly can't express the gratitude, the depth that we feel. I, looking at myself, I wouldn't say that I'm amazing, but if it wasn't for all the doctors and the nurses and the response teams, I don't think I would still be here. They keep me going because they saved me, so I shouldn't give up now with how hard they worked for me. Every time someone asks me, I say, oh, I'm gonna walk again. Like, I don't care what anyone says, I will find a way to walk again. Inside this gym, Becky Parmalau pours her heart into all she does. Each push on the pedal, each step on the treadmill is a triumphant moment. Moments she and her family thought she might never experience again. You can think that you're in such good health, um, but these types of things can really happen to anyone. Just a few months earlier, while Becky and her husband Jeremiah were skiing in Breckenridge for their five-year anniversary, they came face to face with a moment that would forever change their lives. As we were just dishing up lunch, I started having the chest pain and tingling down my left arm. And at that point, I thought, well, I personally couldn't really be having a heart attack, right? I'm so healthy. Jeremiah quickly drove Becky to a nearby hospital. As soon as I mentioned my wife experienced chest pains, literally a woman came out within three seconds, grabbed her, and took her to the back. Doctors found that the inside layer of Becky's arteries had torn open, creating a blockage and a severe heart attack. She was suffering from spontaneous coronary artery dissection or SCAD. Doctors told Jeremiah that in order for any chance of survival, they needed to send Becky by air to University of Colorado Hospital, the only hospital in the region with the expertise to help. He was like, she has hours. We need to get her via flight. Very few of the patients look like Becky coming in, you know, young, healthy patients. We have all of the positives going for her. You see that she should be able to come through this, but quickly we found out how sick her heart was. What was really unusual is her heart was so dead that neither side moved hardly at all. Doctors explained the severity of Becky's injuries. I purely uh, inquired uh, how likely is Becky uh, going to make it through this procedure. And they said that your, your wife is an extremely sick girl, extremely sick, and we can only offer that we'll do our very best. And I was like, can you give me a percentage? He's like, it's very difficult for me to do so, but I can say 30%. But Becky's story was far from over, and her setback was about to become the platform for her comeback. These surgeons are at the top of their game. I've seen them work miracles with a lot of our patients, um, and this was a great example. Against all odds, Becky made it through five surgeries in two days, and doctors implanted a temporary device to circulate her blood. Completely kept alive by machines and in dire need of a new heart, Becky was put at the top of the transplant list with nothing left to do but wait. She had a finite amount of time. I mean, they had the assist devices in. They were at the last stage of being able to use those devices. She was not leaving the hospital until she got transplanted. After 14 days of waiting and wondering if she'd get the heart she desperately needed, a doctor came into her room, locked eyes with Becky, and smiled. And then I asked him, do we have a heart? And he said, yes, we have a heart. Heart transplant, I think, is amazing because as soon as you get it plugged in, that heart starts beating. And I, I think it's completely humbling to us. I believe it was Dr. Babu who came out and said that everything is great. The heart's ticking. I don't think that any of us who've never been transplanted will truly fully get it. I've never had my life this close to being taken from me. So when it's given back to you in full, I can't imagine what that's like. Not everybody takes it as a gift. And this is somebody that has nurtured this gift and will continue to give back. The other thing that I do think about is the fact that another person had to perish in order for me to live. I do 
plan to write a letter to that family, thanking them for the gift that they've given me and letting them know the plans that I have to use this new chance at life. And then I would like to someday be able to meet that family and give them the opportunity if they want to listen to their daughter's heart still beating. I am a welder. It's what I live for. It's where I can get away from the world, watching that metal melt, cutting out patterns. I think, well, what can I do to make this rusty, dirty metal better? It makes me happy. It's like a fulfillment. When I first started getting the Parkinson's, I'd try to weld and I'd see double. My leg would hurt and I would limp. My arm started hurting too. To see him feel that way, it was so hard. He's my favorite person. And for him to have that thought that he wasn't able to do it the way he was used to, it was horrible. I felt about this big. I tried hard to do the things I do and I couldn't. Walking my dogs, cycling. It's been almost a year since I danced with my wife. He would always put on music and they'd dance together. <laughs> yeah, they loved to dance. When I got to that point where I couldn't take the meds anymore, I finally went up to University of Colorado Hospital. I mean, obviously, you know, all of us want to cure Parkinson's disease. You can imagine that if you're spending that much effort fighting your body to move, it doesn't leave any time for anything else. Deep brain stimulation surgery allows us to restore normal circuit function to the brain. That then allows patients to walk normally, to use their hands normally. It gives people back their independence. I'm so grateful for how everything went. He can keep going on with his life. Can't wait to get on that bike. <laughs> Enjoy the things in life that people take for granted. I mean, you feel the wind and the coolness against your face. You just look up and thank God for letting you ride your bike. Dance once again with my wife and spinning her around. It's perfect now. You can do everything you used to do and some. <laughs> I got my love back. <laughs> Can't say enough about the hospital, all the doctors. We're all fighting for one thing and it came true. That rusty piece of metal to make it shine, it'll become artwork. My artwork. I go to coffee four days a week. It's a place that we can kind of just go and be real. We swap stories and, and people could tell me stuff without being the preacher or judging them. He's a people person. He loves people. Sometimes I think, you know, there's not enough of him to go around and yet he makes enough. Every morning I think this could be the last time I'm there. I just think this has taught me that life is pretty fragile. But when I went through all of this, I wouldn't have made it without my wife. We've been married be 48 years in December. Every day that I have, I want her to know that she's more important to me than life. They tell me I'm one of 1% that survived what I experienced with my heart. I had been to coffee, and I came home and let the dog out, and we went for a walk. We got to the end of the sidewalk here, and my left leg just caved in on me. I had a aortic dissection. My cardiologist said there's only two guys in town that could do the surgery I needed, then shipped me to Memorial Hospital. Terry had what's called a type a aortic dissection. About 50% of people who have a type A aortic dissection do not make it to the hospital. 
depending on the center that he goes to, upwards of 20 or 30 percent chance that he doesn't make it through the surgery. I just knew he may not make it. I don't want to spend life without him. He's the love of my life. Really good centers, like ours, fortunately, have a particular expertise at dealing with these types of problems. Dr. Walensky stayed with me 36 hours straight. Yeah, I just, he's my hero. <laughs> Dr. Walensky was standing there, and he says, okay, Karen, this is the moment we've been waiting for. And I saw his blue eyes and that smile. <laughs> And I got to see those again from the eyes of that 18-year-old girl. That's probably a moment that I won't forget as long as I live, those blue eyes. I have to confess today that I wonder sometimes why God would spare a tired old preacher. The easy answer is there's something for me to accomplish. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm convinced that there's something yet that he wanted me to do. And I want to do the very best that I can to accomplish that. Who knows what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. Every day is a gift. I wake up in the morning and I'm in the pool by eight and I swim for an hour, tread water. It's a time to reflect and it's just a blessing to be here. My grandchildren are just so precious. They're staying with us for the summer. I think it's very important to, you know, build memories any way you can. I'm gonna make every minute count because I, I really didn't think I was gonna be here. She's extremely positive. I, I've, I'm the one that's more emotional about the whole thing than she is. It's been much harder on him than me. We got married in July, and that December is when I was diagnosed, December 9th. Unfortunately, my cancer had gone from my breast to my lymph nodes and had left the lymph nodes and had moved through my body. You know, I'm an engineer and I'm a problem solver. And with this, I just felt totally out of control. And I didn't want to be without her. At that point, you're getting pretty desperate. We were looking real hard to get involved in a clinical trial. When she came to us interested in clinical trials, it was really meaningful to me personally to be able to offer her a treatment that I knew had the potential to work. One of the areas that we're doing a lot of research in is in immunotherapy. And that means trying to harness the body's own immune system to fight cancer. As soon as she got on the trial drug, the tumors just started to disappear in a matter of weeks. The scans showed that the cancer was not detectable using a scan. This is something that we just don't see with this type of cancer. And I think this is you know, the closest that we've been so far to developing a cure for metastatic cancer. I wouldn't be here without him. He's my biggest cheerleader. He's never missed a visit. He comes with me every single time. Being able to offer clinical trials to patients wouldn't be possible without the generous support of our donors. Without ongoing fundraising, we wouldn't be able to do this work. It's wonderful to be alive, and I just thank God for great doctors. I thank God for my husband and my family. We decided we were going to be a team and, <laughs> and do this thing, you know, and we did. Yeah. My shins hurt. I knew I could push through because I'd been competing on my shins for two years. So I said, what's another four years? I, I can do this. Once you're a freshman, everyone gets a, um, a visit with the orthopedic doctor. That was Dr. Wilcott. She sent me to UC Health 
So we got x-rays on her and they showed what we had suspected and feared is that she had been chronically breaking her legs and allowing them to heal over time. She developed these black lines in her tibias, which were chronic stress fractures. There was no way it was going to heal on its own. I needed surgery immediately. It was really up to me whether or not I wanted to go for it with it or wanted to just be done with gymnastics altogether. We knew that bringing her back to a really high level of competitive gymnast was going to, was going to be a challenge. In order to get these black lines to heal, you need to stabilize them. We needed to essentially put rods down through the center of her tibia in both legs. That stimulates some healing in that area and it also takes some of the tension and stress off of the side of the bone that wasn't healing. I know my surgery wasn't simple, but I know I had a positive attitude, so my recovery process might have been the least difficult. <laughs> I really remember that first meet back after everything. When she did that floor routine and did it by herself and the crowd lit up and it was so exciting being like, wow, full Nina. Oh yeah. <laughs> I've done something amazing and I didn't give up on it. I trusted a group of people to help me get to where I wanted to be. So why give up? Nina is an amazing person. I mean, you meet her and you realize that her energy and her drive is what, what really makes her successful. It's very cool what we get to do and what people give us permission to do, but this isn't where we get those warm, fuzzy feelings. We get those warm, fuzzy feelings in the clinic at the end of their recovery when we discharge them. The moral of this story is to never give up. Don't let someone tell you that you can't. If you believe you can do it, if you believe you can make it through this, then you can. This is my mom and I with Henry. Giving you kisses. Hi, buddy. Hi. So my mom and I rode together growing up. This is Henry. I mean, she rode as a kid, and that was always kind of her great passion. And then she got me into riding, so I mean, I was on, I think at like, what, six months the first time? You were or, like about eight months old. So it was a very special life together, because we had, we had a life as mom and daughter, but we had a life as like two riders, and it, it sort of develops a, a camaraderie. You know, everything was good. Like I had my working life on the ranch, unloading hay and everything. And then I had a, a little accident and got a splinter in my thumb, which didn't heal. The nurse practitioner at my work thought, this doesn't look right. The labs were totally off the charts. So then she got an appointment with a hepatologist right away. He said, you know, you have a genetic disorder and you're already actually at stage four. You, know, you need a liver transplant or you're gonna oh, yeah. die from this disease. And we were just so, I mean, it like stopped our world that yeah. day. I knew you could be a live donor. So that was the first thing I asked this hepatologist is what do I need to do to be a donor? Liver surgery in general is considered to be a major operation. We do a very extensive evaluation of the donor to try to assess risk as best as we can. There is still a very small but real possibility that there could be a catastrophic complication. For me, the decision was very straightforward. I mean, I had had no yeah. hesitation about being a donor. I know, you did It was didn't. hard to convince you to let me do it. It was like, why would I do it when I've already had a good life? And she hasn't even, she, you were 26, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you had a whole life ahead of you. I don't think that there has ever been a parent that I have ever met that did not feel very ambivalent about the possibility of their child being a donor for them. I think it's just part of human nature. I mean, and that was my argument to her is that you can't make me watch you die knowing that I could save your life. That's not fair to leave me with that and I'm not going to be happy if you're not here. I would say that's probably the most scary thing about it. It, not the transplant or anything. It was the whole idea of doing the transplant. It was like, I can't believe I'm actually allowing this. I woke up and there was a resident. I asked him how my mom was doing and I said, can I send her a note? And he gave me the back of his prescription pad and I wrote a note to her. 
and he took it to you and he brought a note back. I had a lot of questions about just, I don't know, the <laughs> surgery and anatomy. And, and so I remember the residents coming in and finally just bringing a textbook and like, okay, and sat down with me and like, we're explaining all this stuff. And I was like, this is the route I'm gonna take. I had lived through an experience that very few providers mm -hmm. and liver would have had. And so it's just seemed natural to go into that field because I could connect with those patients on a different level. So the alternative then to waiting on the list for a cadaveric um, organ would be to do live donor transplant. Her experience I think is something that's incredibly helpful and obviously very unusual. I can barely see it anymore. She's like the poster child for living donation because you look at her and she's just an incredible person. She provides a dimension and a perspective that is so valuable to our team. From a personal standpoint, it's like the best thing I've ever done. You know, my mom's still here 12 years later, healthy. Okay, we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> it is an extraordinary experience that very few people mm -hmm. go through in their lives. I, so I think it changes. It changes. Yeah. It changes. Yeah. Personalized medicine is the new direction of healthcare. It's about delivering a tailored approach to medicine that accounts for your individual differences in genes, environment, and lifestyle. Rather than using a one-size-fits-all approach, it will change the way people receive medical care. The new Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine is working to make personalized medicine a reality and the standard of care for Coloradans. We have built the foundation to study patients across our healthcare system who want to participate in this exciting new approach to medicine. Our goal is to understand how differences among people impact health and disease, and to use this knowledge to make healthcare more effective and targeted to individual patient needs. To further this cutting edge research and make new discoveries about health and disease, the Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine has opened a biobank where all interested patients can participate. A biobank securely stores individual patient samples for research and clinical testing. To improve our understanding of personalized medicine, we need to capture a large quantity of individual samples. Initially, the biobank will fuel research and discovery into personalized medicine, setting the stage to treat patients with personalized medical care across our healthcare system. Personalized medicine represents the future of medicine, we want physicians and researchers of the future to use the discoveries made in the biobank to treat patients in more customized ways. We hope to be able to maintain health and manage disease in a much more effective manner. Your role in making this vision of modern medicine a reality for all Coloradans is simple and convenient. You may contribute by simply signing our consent form, agreeing to donate a small blood sample the next time your blood is drawn. The consent process is available at select UC Health locations, as well as through our online patient portal, My Health Connection. Your privacy is of the utmost importance at the Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine. We follow federal privacy laws and healthcare regulations to protect your information. We will take all reasonable steps to keep information about you private. Your participation will benefit research into people's health and diseases. Please join us in changing and improving the future of healthcare for generations to come. I've been riding motorcycles since I was 16 years old, so 53 years, I guess. I'm the senior intermediate first place holder of the Rocky Mountain Trials Association. I ride what they call observed trials. You ride through an obstacle course in natural environment without putting your feet down or falling off or going out of bounds. 
I was riding my uh, trials bike and been riding all day and made a wrong turn and ended up landing on my leg with my full weight of my body and the motorcycle. And I felt it pop and incredible pain at that point. When I went to Dr. Johnny, I just went in limping, of course. He told me his knee was bothering him. He told me he was, a, he was an athlete and he competed in motorcycle trials and he was currently leading the master's division in the state of Colorado. I was like, well, that's great. Tell me what your goals are. And he told me he wanted to win. I kept waiting for him to say, I don't think so. I said, well, let's figure out what's going on. We got the MRI and it, and it showed his meniscus tear. And I said, we can treat this. And then fitting with his goals to try to get back this season as quickly as possible, he understood that surgery was his best bet. Considering his overall health and, and his status as an athlete, I had a feeling he'd be able to recover pretty quickly. When I left there, I thought, I'm gonna be able to finish the series. Those two events, and he says, tell you what, what if we just ride, we, he said, what if we just ride one of those events? And that turned out to be the CUPS event that I won. As an orthopedic sports medicine specialist, we don't tend to save lives, we tend to save lifestyles. When you see them get back to that, something that provides them enjoyment and fulfillment in their life, it makes it all worthwhile. When we first opened the Empire, we certainly went head to head. My dad is trained by old school chefs. When he wants something done away, it's the only way, and that's the way that you have to do it. And one of the tricks of the trade is to take some of that pasta water and put it into your bowl. And this has such wonderful flavor. I think that having that ego, if you will, has allowed him to become the great chef that he has. It was a pretty chubby kid. We used to call him Food King. He would stop at two different friends' houses for dinner and then come home. So I would say he always had a love of food. If you come from a family where you grow up eating good food, you become more interested in how you make good food. He was on the Julia Child Show. First course to be created for us by Jim Cohen in Denver, Colorado. That's where he really got noticed on a national level. One of the rules that I have for him is um, he has to provide me with recipes that are world-class recipes, but that I can make very easily. Being committed to the end product is something that he has incorporated into many different aspects of his life. He's willing to take all of the steps that you need to take in order to get there. It was right before Labor Day weekend of 2015. We have a tradition of going to the Telluride Film Festival. Jim was going to go to Basalt first and spend some time at my brother's house, and then we were all going to meet in Telluride. 911, what is your emergency? My brother, I think, is having a stroke. His name is James Cohen. Oh, Jesus, he can't talk. He had slept through the morning breakfast, and his brother thought, well, he was just tired. He's been working really hard. Jim had been awake for several hours and was unable to yell out that he needed help. You know, one of the hardest things for me when I first heard about his stroke was I felt like no one in the world knows me the way that Jim does. Nothing seems real at that point. You feel like you're in a dream. It took my breath away, almost like if he can't breathe, I can't breathe. A stroke of this type is especially deadly. You're wide awake, but you can't breathe, you can't move, you're completely paralyzed. It's called what's being locked in. There was a blood clot that we had to pull out to restore blood flow back to the brainstem. We're all just kind of sitting and praying in the waiting room and trying to be positive and kind of distract ourselves from the inevitable truth of this, that most likely he was gonna die. It was very, very difficult to witness and to, and to see what had happened to my friend. He could only communicate by blinking his eyes. One blink yes, two blinks no, but he couldn't say anything and he couldn't ask anything. So he was dependent on us asking the right question. I had been planning to propose for a while. We had a trip planned to uh, go up to Montana, but then this incident happened and we weren't certain if Jim was going to make it. And so I certainly wanted to 
asked for his permission to um, uh, marry his daughter. I walked into to Jim's room and sat next to him and I held his hand, let him know that I'm deeply in love with his daughter and was uh, asking for his blessing. He gave a very and of course, I was thrilled, and we needed something uplifting and happy to happen. Andy came back into the solarium, and he got down on a knee, and... Lexi, I love you very much, and I look forward to a great life with you, and I hope I hope you do too. Would you, would you have my hand to marriage? Yes. <laughs> We always talk about the polar opposites of life, right? Here was a devastating family event, and here was a joyous one. When you die, you hope your children are all in good places, and I think it was nice for him to know that Lexi was in a good place. I think it's the one and only engagement on the Neuro ICU. The decision was made that Ben Honigman and I would be the people to, to talk to Jim about what he wanted done medically. We tried to let him know, we don't know what the chances are for you to, to recover or to walk or to talk. I mean, we used very simple language. And the doctors want to know whether you want them to continue to treat you aggressively. And I remember very clearly that, uh, that he said he wanted to live. Frequently in these types of situations, everyone's focusing on all the things that like Jim can't do. And I get to be that person that walks into the room and says, I'm sorry all of this happened, but there's life after this. He was the one who said, if you see a little movement, then, you know, there's hope. At first, it was mostly eye movements or blinking, but that was it. Over probably about a week or so, he gained enough eye movement that we could start to use an eye gaze chart with the eye gaze chart, he looks at a letter and then you being the able-bodied person move the chart until your eyes lock. And then they go to the next letter of the word. One of his big goals that he communicated rather early on, he was still in the ICU I think, was that I'm going to my daughter's wedding. This is not a maybe, this is what's going to happen. I think that the rehab folks began to feel like there was optimism. I went to go see him and he was just in tears because I was able to get him to move in a certain way he had never seen before. I told the family, there's a lot of hope here. We're going to get Craig Hospital out to come and see you guys. They're going to see all the great things that you're doing. I'm still going to be seeing you regularly. When he first got in that walking machine, which I have the video of, when he looks over and smiles, you could just see his eyes light up when he got in that and he would be in the standing position and there he was, his big tall self. It's like you're walking on the moon. As long as you're capitalizing on that signaling pathway that's there, you never stop gaining function. He kept making progress, which was again so motivating for him. But I, I can't imagine anyone putting more effort. Six. <laughs> he was moving his arm somewhat against gravity and that was just heart melting uh, for everybody. Because if you can do that, you can feed yourself. You can adjust your glasses. You can scratch that itch on your face. You can uh, take a sip of water. That opens so many possibilities. Just being able to bend your arm up. My goal all along for the past eight months to get to a point where I could walk Leslie down the aisle. When you're a chef, you have to love the joy you bring other people. It teaches you how to be excellent in whatever you're doing. All it takes is time and effort. These cases are, are great because there's always that possibility of, of hitting a home run. At that point, Lexi had declared that her wedding was gonna be in June. So it wasn't even a year. And Ben and I were like. And I just, at one point, I was like, I just can't imagine him walking. 
We just felt like, you know, have realistic goals. You might walk in a couple of years, but you're not gonna walk Lexi down the aisle. And sure enough. I've always been a daddy's girl and to have my dad actually make it and walk down the aisle was just wonderful. I think there's a deep wisdom there that you have control over your own life. Jim's experience is a constant reminder to never forget that. You can never give up. All things are possible. So now Jim's current goal is that he's going to ride his bike to Buffalo, New York. <laughs> Three, four months ago I would have said, mm, no way, ain't going to happen. But I, I, don't, I don't say no anymore. Praise the world, praise its fullness, and its longing, its beauty, and its grief. Praise stone and fire, lilac and river, and the solitary bird at the window. Praise the moment when the whole bursts through pain, and the moment when the whole bursts forth in joy. Praise the dying beauty with all your breath, and see the beauty of the world is your own. Quickly now, UC Health wants to make sure you know the signs of a stroke by using Be Fast. Remember, Be Fast and you could stop a stroke. B is for balance. You have sudden difficulty standing or walking. E is for eyes. You have sudden vision loss or double vision. That's E for eyes, ladies and gentlemen. F is for face. Your smile becomes uneven or droops on one side. A is for arm. One arm becomes weak. That's A for arm. S is for speech, meaning your speech becomes slurred or jumbled. D is for it's time to call 911. It's that simple. UC Health wants you to be fast to stop a stroke. My name is Jenny Arthur. Every Tuesday and Thursday, I volunteer with the kids at UC Health Memorial Hospital. Good job. Well, you won. We'll play games, do puzzles, we'll read to kind of get their minds off of, you know, what they're dealing with. You did a great job. I like for them to know that they have a friend in me. You're doing good, Bailey. They ask me questions like, what do you do? They're like, you know, you're training for the Olympics? <laughs> but I'm competing at the 2016 Olympic Games in Olympic style weightlifting. The day I found out I qualified for the Olympics, all I could do was really cry. It was a dream come true, literally. It's a grind, I mean, it really is. And you have to be focused every day and you have to be determined. And sometimes, you know, you don't feel like training, but you gotta do the things that it takes to reach the next level. My goal at the Olympic Games is to, is to podium. I want to, you know, show people that it's possible uh, to reach your goals as long as you stay focused. It's a huge blessing. It really is. And, you know, you think about competing on the, this bigger platform. It's a dream come true. It really is. But I love helping others. I think it's very powerful. It's a powerful experience for me. It's, it's all about giving back. I think it's a huge blessing to be in the position that I'm in. It's a family farm here. I think I'm a fifth or sixth generation farmer. You start out early in the morning and you work all day long. It's just a sense of satisfaction whenever you can look throughout the field and say, I did this, I, I completed what I was gonna do. I look up to my dad every single day and just try to be more like him. He's one of the hardest workers I know. Jeb. Jeb. Yeah. <laughs> He's our youngest son. He wants to come back and farm and learn all about being a part of this legacy that we have. Jeb came home from 
college in December for Christmas break and he kind of had this cough. He was coughing so bad when he came home he couldn't keep anything down so we took him right into the emergency room at Springfield. They were going to send us to Denver. They'd done testing throughout that day and we found out he had cancer. It was really, really devastating. Oh man, it was, I don't. I said, I don't have cancer, you know. it. I was one of those kids, just nothing, that's not gonna happen to me. But then it sure did. Obviously a 19 year old with cancer is not something normal. Jeb Schroeder should be in his second year of college near home in Southeast Colorado. I had to drop out completely. Jeb was diagnosed with testicular cancer. I started chemo immediately once they figured it out. That chemo was uh, really hard to take, you know. When his hair just started to fall out just in clumps and that was really yeah. hard because he said it's real, but he conquered it. I just told myself, I'm gonna wake up tomorrow. I don't feel like I'm gonna die. I'm gonna, I'm gonna live through this. I'm gonna power on through. UC Health has a program called Moment to Shine. They knew that he loved baseball and loved the Rockies. They would say, okay, we're gonna do this surprise when you guys come up for your appointment. I was like, why are we here so early? Like, what's, what's going on? Open up a door. And then all the nurses are there that took care of me. And then out comes Vinny Castilla. He's a legend, you know? everybody knows who Vinny Castilla is. When Vinny came out, he was just... He was in shock. He was, yeah. I think you were too. Yeah. <laughs> they gave me tickets to the 4th of July game. This is the tickets right here for the, for the, for the game and the fireworks, the best fireworks in town. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize like what it was going to be. I thought I was just going to go to the game and hang out. But when I got there, they escorted me onto the field. My grandparents and my parents and my brothers went up there and my girlfriend was up there. And I really started to realize how blessed I was. I met Nolan Arenado and Carlos Gonzalez. Good luck, guys. Never would have thought I'd be able to meet them. You know, we're just a little podunk farming family from southeastern Colorado. We're not anybody special. But then you do realize that people do care and it blows my mind. Mm. I'm just thankful to raise awareness to just the kids just like me. It, it can really happen to anybody. Just get yourself checked and be, just be safe. You know, I feel like I'm gonna live a long, healthy life. I'm gonna be around when I'm 90 years old, I guarantee it. <laughs>
So the man that I've always known to be so strong and healthy is not anymore. I talked to God a lot and just said, if this is it, like you need to take him home because I just gotta stand to watch him suffer. I just had to tell myself, you have to let him go to God. They did all the tests and they said, yeah, uh, you're probably gonna have to get a stem cell transplant. It's your last, that's really your last hope. It really shone through for me the strength that he gained from his time in Iraq and that strength that he was able to draw on as he went through everything. In the military, you're, you're taught, you see the mission through to the end. You can just see, you know, the touch of the bracelet. He gave his life for us. He would expect us to live it for our fullest to make the most of it. The first time the girls got to see him after transplant, that was an amazing day. The girls were crying, can I touch dad? <laughs> can I just hug him, mom? Yeah, get over there and hug him. It was like God was telling me, it's okay. You're fine, he's fine, it's, everything's gonna be okay. I think it was last year, Dr. Jonathan Gutman, he said, I think I can comfortably say that you're cured. Every year we have two birthdays because the day that he had his transplant, he got to start his life over. My parents made me who I am today. My mom taught me how to be kind. And my dad taught me how to be brave. I feel lucky every single day, you know. Whatever it is that you value in life, surround yourself with that. Losing my hair made me realize how sick I really was. That was tough for me to come to terms with. I've never had any health issues. I did do self exams, you know, but I honestly could not feel it. And I was talking to my surgeon and she said, I would not have expected you to be able to feel this. They really are finding it with this 3D technology. Five minutes turned out to obviously be the best five minutes of my life that I've spent. Breast cancer is the most frequent type of cancer in women. Up to one out of eight will get breast cancer during her life. In Holly's case, she didn't feel sick at all, but she chose to have a 3D mammography. 3D mammography showed us that this image in Holly's right breast was really concerning. They said they wanted to see me right away. I just started thinking the worst. I had so much more that I wanted to do. I mean, I want to see my kids get married. I still want to travel. I just did not want this to be what defined me. When the doctor came in, it was actually a relief because he told me I was only stage two. Cancer was caught early. If she had waited, she might have developed a palpable tumor one or two years later that it would have been much harder to treat and especially hard to cure. My cancer team at UC Health did more than just treat my cancer. They treated the whole person. The UC Health cancer team was amazing. On October 16th, Nicole called me. She was really excited <laughs> and she told me that my margins are clear. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, that was um, a really good day. <laughs> it really was. It was so good to be able to call all my kids and tell them, you know, that I was cancer free. It is absolutely worth going and getting checked and making sure that you are healthy. If five minutes will give you a lifetime, I can't imagine why you wouldn't do it. We wanted this for so long and every day I wake up and I'm like, I'm a mom. The joy of finding out we were having a child was amazing. So I walk in the door <laughs> from, this, from this trip and there's a huge sign that says, congratulations, we're having twins. And I just, <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> then the ultrasound, Camden was this very kind of wild, seemingly outgoing he yeah kiddo he was <laughs> basically left no room for finn to spread out and whenever and, they went to finn in the ultrasound like camden's little hand would come through yeah, right, yeah. you don't think anything can go wrong 
we had gone in for a fetal echo. They said, we're having trouble finding Camden's heartbeat. And we said, please, like, can we do an ultrasound? Just, just check, just check. And like, I just kept thinking, like, if they do it, they'll find it. And um, that was a tough reality. That was a tough reality. Camden calmly came out and gave Finn the opportunity to, to have a couple more days inside. I think Camden is one of the most selfless beings that will ever walk through our life. He gave Finn that time. Dr. Donnelly came in and said, okay, we can't stop the labor anymore, so we're gonna do this. You don't even think you can have a baby at 24 weeks. And then the next thing I know, I hear a little voice. He was one pound, seven ounces. He just looked like a fetus. Michael was standing on the opposite side of the isolette, and I said, uh, let me see your wedding ring. And I put it over Finn's hand, and it went clear up to his shoulder. And they're like, oh my god. And then when I got in there to do my cares, he just fought. I mean, he was hitting me with his arms, he was kicking me with his legs, he's pulling at tubes, he's moving his head. I felt like I was going around with, with Muhammad Ali. It's the will to live. They like lifted the incubator and, and I could stick like my hand in and he instantly just wrapped his little fingers. Like he just knew. I was like, okay buddy, like you're gonna be okay. We're gonna do this. This place is a roller coaster of emotions. You know, they'll have good days. He'd gain 25 grams. Um, and we would be like throwing cheering a and, yeah. and they're gonna have bad days. Like watching a hospital monitor and just saying, come on bud, like. And it's the parents that cling to those good days. And then we got down to like one IV stand. And the lines start to come and off. And the lines he's, start to come off. He's got fewer things connected to him. When we took him off of the vent, and I made these buttons to show support for him to fly off of the vent. You stand there and you wait for that first cry. And as soon as it comes, you just, you take a breath too. They had such a positive attitude and a positive outlook on this whole thing. And that they, I think, made Finn go home. Not us, I think they did. Suddenly, we were leaving the place where both of our boys were born, and only one was coming home. We didn't truly, truly mourn Camden until after Finn came home from the NICU. His ashes were spread in the mountains. Every tree, you know, the snow on the ground, it's almost like Finn knows that his brother's a part of that too. And we are eternally grateful. Well, one of the things that I really enjoy is the outdoors. I always have my camera with me. When you live where I live, there's always a photo opportunity. I feel that 50% of photography is being there. If you can't get there, you can't get the photo. When I broke my leg and I looked down and saw it hanging off, I figured it was gone. I never thought they would ever put my leg back on. On October of 2014, I was working as a painter and I was painting a house. So Delvin was on a ladder on the job when he fell off the ladder. He sustained a complex fracture. So you can see both bones are completely detached. He developed an infection and he was referred here to see if we could prevent an amputation and salvage his leg. If they couldn't get that infection out, you know, they were gonna have to amputate. Dr. Stoneback had told me that he was gonna do everything he could to save my leg. I always tell patients that you're in good hands, but this is a marathon, not a sprint. When you come here to the limb restoration program, what you want is a team that does a lot of this type of work that communicates. The collection of specialists required to deal with these complex problems are not available just anywhere. And they happen to be centered 
here on this campus. Every surgery I had, I felt very confident that they knew what they were doing and that they were doing everything they could. Limb restoration works is very much like a chess match. One of the first things we did was take all of the plates and screws out and deal with the infection with Dr. Carla Savelli's help and the Infectious Disease Service. I enlisted the help of my plastic and reconstructive surgery colleague, Dr. Mathis. Dr. Mathis actually took an abdominal muscle and used it to cover the ankle wound. It's pretty amazing to think that someone can take your stomach muscle and put it on your leg. I never even thought of such a thing, but I'm glad somebody did. Delvin was a phenomenal patient. Going through those steps with someone, seeing them from the darkest point of their life to their restored self, now he's back to doing the things he loves and he's ecstatic with the outcome, as am I. I mean, I'm very thankful that I have my leg. I go a little slower than what I used to go, but hey, I still go, you know? And I've got the pictures to prove it, so. I live about three miles outside of the town of Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We have two horses. We have two mules that are full brothers, Gus and Clancy. We have 10 goats right now. Then I have a little special needs goat called Patsy. She's my constant companion. When she was born, her legs were bent this way instead of being born this way. So Patsy has a little bit of a hard time getting around. We're kind of kindred spirits, as I've been told. Both of us with elbow issues. I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis about 14, 15 years ago, and it just started deteriorating my elbow joints with just intense chronic pain 24 hours a day. And there were days that I didn't want to get out of bed. It got very dark for me for a while. My garden, I didn't get any time out there last year. This place is my getaway from the world. I thought I was gonna have to just let it become overrun with weeds and it was breaking my heart. Looking at a life on pain medication, I, that's not the kind of life I wanna live. Barb came into my office complaining of elbow pain. She said she couldn't even do anything during the day because her pain was just so bad. If you can't control the pain anymore, and you say, I'm at the point where I'm willing to undergo the risk of surgery, that's when it's time to replace your elbow. He said they actually replace the elbow joint. They take the old one out, put the new one in. Two days after her surgery, she said, the pain is so much better. And I said, well, where is your pain? And she said, my other elbow. Can you replace my other one? How soon can we do this? Barb is special for Yampa Valley Medical Center because she's the first elective total elbow replacement that's been done here. And we did both of her elbows. I feel like I've been given a new lease on life. I wake up in the morning and I look out the window and I just thank Lord for what a beautiful day to wake up with no pain and be out just with the animals. I can spend hours out there with them now instead of minutes. I got my joy and my happiness back and my outlook on life is so much better. Barb is back, look out. <laughs> He's an adrenaline junkie. <laughs> <laughs> he loves the snowboard when he gets out there. I mean, we grew up doing that. Snowboarding for me has always been a freedom to get away from everything and just kind of be able to focus on something else that isn't, you know, in my mind. Children don't ask to be born. They don't ask for the genetic makeup that they get. I talked with Jonathan and you know, I've said, I, I hope you can feel the absolute unconditional love that's there.
I'm diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. I felt like my brain has always been against me, that I feel like there's a little part of my brain, which is the real me, and then the other 90% of it just is like out to destroy everything I want to do and become. I know it's embarrassing for you, but do you mind saying a little bit about what some of your triggers are? In my mind, I get basically panic attacks when I have to touch something from east of Colorado. Fast food, I don't want to be near it, around it, touch it. It just is another trigger for me that just totally freaks my OCD out and makes my brain just want to turn off. I just really dislike American cars. Okay. And it's like beyond that. It's to a point where I don't want to touch them or sit in them. My mind shuts down and I really can't even do anything. I basically have to go home and sleep because I just can't even take it. There's so many things I've wanted to accomplish by now that I'm totally capable of doing that I just haven't because of my OCD. Took some graduate classes at DU. It's just so hard even being in a classroom because I don't even hear what the instructor's saying. It's just my thoughts like, you know, trying to avoid things that will contaminate me. What sort of rituals would you do if you feel like you're contaminated by one of these things? Wash my hands and then take a shower as soon as possible. And then I might throw away the clothes I was wearing. Okay. And how much do these obsessions interfere? Would you say mild, definite but manageable, substantial or incapacitating? Today incapacitating. I haven't done hardly any of the things I should be doing with okay. my life. I was at a point where my knuckles were ripped open and bleeding and I was actually hospitalized and everyone in there thought I had just gotten into a ton of fights. It was actually just washing my hands so much. I try really, really hard to hide it from people. I've actually lost a lot of friends. There's a lot of kids I used to snowboard with when I was younger and they I think I just lost my mind. It feels like if you can just figure it out or fix it or solve it, everything will be better. If you think about it, if you're in a actually dangerous situation, so you're on the highway or a road and you see a car barreling towards you, it makes sense to jump out of the way. When someone has OCD, it feels that scary and that imminent. And so can you imagine there's a car barreling towards you and Someone you trust has told you the car is not actually barreling toward you. Can you imagine trying to just like stay there and let the car hit you? And that's what it feels like in OCD. He's felt like a burden for some time. I've never felt that. And so, um, you know, even on the most difficult days, it's just more the empathy, I wish I could take away the pain. You know, my psychiatrist told me straight up that there's not much left she can do for me. Up to 80% of uh, people with OCD will have some response to the standard treatment. About 10% of those people are severely affected and are the ones we would consider for deep brain stimulation. Even though it has an amazing response rate, there's still about 50% of people who will respond. And I think to have gone through a neurosurgical procedure, to have this feel like your last hope, and then to have it not work can be devastating. I guess if I was gonna be able to call it a success, if I first seen something would just be maybe like a metaphorical weight that we maybe wouldn't be able to see, but we would know had been lifted. Jonathan, so 
smile and not have that painful look on his face when he's trying so hard um, just to do something normal. Tomorrow they're gonna um, put some hardware into my brain. We'll hopefully um, uh, relieve some of these uh, obsessions and compulsions. When I was younger, just seeing movies and like how they used to do lobotomies and I would think like that's the only way I have a chance is just to honk off a part of my brain that's causing me all this like trouble. In a way, I was just like, wow, it's finally happening. <laughs> When I first got to the hospital, they basically screwed this metal cage frame onto my head. Literally screwing into my forehead. Then after that, they, you know, did a bunch of measurements to make sure they're in the right place. Before the surgery, they do an MRI and a CT scan, and they take those images and merge them and then plug it into a computer program. The surgeon knows what specific area of the brain she wants, and so they generate coordinates based on that. And then they put those coordinates into the stereotactic frame, which is then put on the patient's head. The preferable way to do a DBS surgery was with the patient awake. We can do the surgery awake because the brain doesn't actually have nerve endings. The location is based on the coordinates and the trajectory of how they need to get to the area of the brain involved in reward processing. That's part of that circuit we know to be abnormal in OCD. One electrode on each side connected to pulse generators, which are basically batteries that look very much like pacemakers. The actual brain surgery part, that was my least fear. What were you afraid of? Mainly it just not working. That would be like, you know, probably the most disappointing thing, so. Once the electrodes are in place, we do interoperative stimulations. We actually had a team from Alabama observing the surgery, and that was a trigger for him because anything from the South is considered contaminated. We had him interact with uh, the team members and assessed how anxious this made him. When stimulation was turned on, he was actually a little bit better able to interact. What do you think about us, you know, playing going to a view later today? <laughs> <laughs> we also had a fast food wrapper. We assessed his ability to touch it. Willing to consider a little bit, maybe? Um. <laughs> yeah. Ready. Okay. We had his phone in there because his phone is his prized possessions, which he tries to keep clean and not contaminated. And so we assessed his ability to let us contaminate it with the wrapper or let the person from Alabama hold it. We turn on stimulation and we test to be sure that we're getting the response that we want. Change in mood, like a lessening of depression and a reduction in anxiety. Does it feel like you could move on and think about other things now or you feel pretty stuck on the exposures we just did? It does feel easier to move on. If we get that, that bodes well down the road for uh, a reduction in OCD symptoms. This mood that you're feeling now, how would it change things for you? Um, I mean, the depression is definitely lower quite a bit.
I meet with people three days in a row uh, for initial programming. When we program, we use this patient programmer and it sits right over the pulse generator. During the programming, we walk through many, many combinations of different settings to try to find where the person has the best response. John had a pretty remarkable response and that was very cool to see. And a good response, what we're looking for is they feel less anxious and their mood is better. The um, first tuning process was, that's an amazing experience and I'll never, neither one of us will ever forget that. I've just never seen him so happy. I went to Dr. Davis's office and she turned it on for the first time and that was just like, whoa, <laughs> this is incredible. What are you feeling? Uh, it's just the happiest I've ever been. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> just, I was just thinking, like, this is the first time anything mental health wise I've been able to notice. I never get relief, and like now it's like I felt it. I like, can feel it. Feel the relief? Yeah. Excellent. Oh. It's a sneak peek, maybe, of the. Is that even better? It's just crazy, like, how. I just feel good. Barbara, my girlfriend, has been really important to this process. And just being there for me, that's yeah, been really nice. I got accepted into CU Denver for a Masters of Landscape Architecture program, which I start in August, which I'm really excited about. Now, how much joy has it brought you to know how much joy you bring your mom? Just being able to go out with her with the dog has been really nice. I think the joy of knowing she's happy is even more worth it than being better at OCD. I wish I could give this to others because I know, I know how much, you know, other people are still suffering. And I see, um, in my son, um, the hope and the, and the actual results and the possibilities. People ask how this whole device makes me feel and it's always been so hard for me because I don't like know how to explain the feeling I've ever felt before to people. Like I guess in the end, I kind of feel like I just realized this is probably what happiness feels somewhat pretty close to. I haven't been happy in such a long time to feel that is a real, real joy. <laughs>
but we are just so determined. When I was a young kid, my mom used to have this saying and it was the most annoying thing in the world. So before we could leave my porch, my mom forced us to finish this saying and she would say, Rebecca, make the world. She'd leave this nice little pause for you. You'd groan and say, a better place. <laughs> I wanted to give that to my kids. I want them to take it and spread kindness throughout our world. Ever since I moved out, I started to kind of appreciate my mom in a different way and everything that she's done for me. The main thing would be a car accident that I was in when I was a teenager. She was my advocate because I was only 16 years old at the time. I'm sure that was the worst process in the world to see that your kid was sick and that you couldn't do anything about it. It's a mother's worst nightmare to know that there's nothing you can do for your baby. In those nights when I was up looking at him when he was all yellow, I please God just help my son, help him be healthy. Good to see you again. See you. Anyone donating any organ is an extraordinary person. The extraordinary thing about Rebecca is that she did not have a particular recipient in mind, and that's something that we don't often see in liver donation because the severity of the operation is, is significant. I really can't put it into words, but knowing that I helped somebody else get their life back and hopefully get to do some of the things that I get to do, I'm extremely blessed in the fact that I didn't die in that car accident and it forced me to take a new perspective on things. The doctor told me I have some news for you and I knew instantly I was like you have you have a liver and I dropped to the floor and I thanked God. I thanked God. Manolo, when you look down and see your scar, I hope it serves as a reminder of your strength and that life's possibilities are endless. I hope that you were afforded the same happiness that I've been lucky enough to have had. I hope that you remember each and every day how much your mom loves you. But most of all, I hope that this opportunity inspires you to help others to pay it forward and to make the world to make the world a better place. Oh my love, Rebecca.